So I'm Megan. I'm an extension assistant professor. I'm based in Wasatch County over in Heber. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some of my research that I did as a graduate student at Utah State. So um, Lizzie and this, we're going to talk about optimizing it in Utah. And so Lysianthus, the Latin name is Eustoma grandiflorum, definitely is just this grandiose, beautiful flower. So, um, and it is a tender perennial. We have seen it over winter in our high tunnels um, in a zone five. So it can handle colder temperatures, but it's typically grown as an annual for cut flower production. And the great thing about Lysianthus is that it is very tolerant of heat. So when a lot of our other crops like snapdragons start petering out in the summer, they start blooming July um, through August is their main peak, but they can go through October as well, we've seen in our trials. So um, Lysianthus is just a tall, beautiful, multi-branching stem. We typically saw one to four marketable stems per plant, and they were usually 12 to 30 inches in length. And you can see in this photo, we just have different blossom shapes and sizes. We have these large three inch ruffly blooms, some smaller one inch more tightly shaped. So broad range of colors, shapes, everything. If you could cross a rose with a um, carnation, that's what you would get as a lysianthus, just this beautiful rose shape, but kind of similar to a carnation in its growth habit. Um, and for pricing, we found that a minimum of 12 inches was marketable if you are selling them and we would bunch them 10 stems, 10 stems per bunch and they range from 15 to $18 depending on the length of the stems in the bunch. Um, the biggest question I get is, should I sow my own seedlings? And um, my question to you in return would be how much patience you have. These, you have to sow them three to four months in advance before you want to plant them. You can see here in January, we're sowing our seeds, these little tiny yellow dots. <laughs> um, in March, we started to finally see some growth and in May, we were able to plant them out. Um, so a few essentials if you do want to start from seed. I've only seen offered in pelleted seed, which is a little bit more expensive and they only guarantee viability for about a year. So just buy what you need for that year. Um, you also want to purchase trays that are really deep. Uh, Lysianthus actually is a tap root. So um, in these photos here, you can see they're starting to circle and you don't want that. You want the roots to be growing straight down so you can get that large single tap root formation. Um, if you start getting circling like this, uh, you can really limit your yield and product productivity. You also want to use a fine textured media. This is a small seed. Um, you don't want any large, you know, wooden organic material chunks getting in the way. You also need light for germination, so keep them pretty close to the surface. And since we are using fine textured media and light is needed, I would recommend using a capillary mat or some other form of below tray watering. Um, you don't want to do overhead watering, displace all of your seeds. They're also going to be on the mats for a really long time. They're in your greenhouse for a really long time. So. Just put them on the capillary mat. You can kind of forget them out a little bit, but I would recommend fertilizing one to two weeks since they're going to be in there for so long. Um, just a general 20-20-20 fertilizer should work great. And when you're growing them in a greenhouse, you do not want temperatures to get above 80, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. If that happens, it um, can cause rosetting. So the plant will grow a lot of leaves, but it won't actually initiate a flower bud. So keep it below that 80 degrees until it's initiated flowers, then it can handle those warmer temperatures. Um, a few other considerations. Um, since it is going to be in the greenhouse for several months, you might get some um, root or soil borne fungal diseases. So applying fungicides can help to prevent that. You can also start your seeds earlier in a smaller cell trip cell size like a 392 and bump it up to a 288 or larger if you want to so you can get a more established plant. Um, but also you could just buy transplants for reputable sources. Uh, so another thing if you're buying seed or looking for plants, they often have a group number associated with it. And there's a common assumption that the group number one, they're going to bloom first in the year, but that's not what these numbers mean. So 
Cultivars are grouped according to light and temperature requirements for blooming. So this is more related to greenhouse production. Um, so group one, they prefer moderate light and heat. So it's great for spring greenhouse production. You can see a few cultivars we trialed here in 2019 and the group numbers are in the bars. And these bars also represent when we harvested stems. So you can see we had group two and three blooming first and then some group ones too. So this does not indicate when they bloom. I will say that typically the in our trials, group two and group three had higher yields because they are meant for summer and fall production. So trying to stick towards group two and three is usually best when you're picking seeds. Okay, so just talking about a few of the cultivars we trialed, we did seven overall in a lot of different colors. Uh, first was Dublini. And that is a very small bloom, the smallest that we trial. They're usually one, even a half inch bloom diameter sometimes. Um, they come in rose pink, blue, white. Um, those are really pretty. So if you do want a smaller bloom size, Dublini is the way to go. Roseanne, I would highly recommend. They have such unusual colors. This picture does not do it justice, but this is the brown and green. Um, and they do have longer stems and the space between each flower is really far apart. So these are great for taller arrangements or if you wanna cut them up in boutonnieres or something, they'd be good for that. Um, but they can be a little harder to work into an arrangement. And then there's Bolero. The stem length was typically shorter for these, but they have just a gorgeous, really open flower, um, just really uniform flowering time. So almost all of the buds on one stem would open up at once. And Voyage, I don't have a photo, but these are gorgeous. They're very roughly blooms. They're in those pale tones that are really popular right now. And they also have very tall stems. Um, Mariachi, that's also a very open, large bloomed Lysianthus, has a little ruffle to it as well. And it has thicker petals that seem to withstand damage from wind and rain and sun scorch and all those different things. Um, so that one was really great. And I feel like all the flowers were clustered towards the top, so it was easy to work into arrangements. Rosita, um, I mean, the name Rose is in it, has that very iconic rose shape, just very cupped blooms, a lot of different colors. And again, all the flowers were bunched towards the top of the stem. Uh, Corelli, that one was really pretty, um, just really frilly blooms. I'd say these are probably the largest flower diameter that we trialed um, and a lot of different colors too. So when you wanna prepare your site, um, whether it's in a high tunnel like we have here out in the field, I would highly recommend drip irrigation. You can see the drip irrigation lines spaced about 12 inches apart on the right. And then we have our plastic mulch, that's a four foot diameter. And you can see the line right here and that's the drip irrigation under our mulch. So that really helps to lock in moisture in the soil. We don't lose a lot of it um, to warmer temperatures in the summer. Um, you'll also want to incorporate slow release fertilizer or compost based on your soil test so that you know what nutrients you need. Um, and again, you want to transplant plugs. We waited a little bit too long in this photo, but typically when they have about four sets of true leaves, that's a good time to transplant. Six inch spacing is ideal. You could go down to four, eight inch, four inch or up to eight inch, um, but we found six inch worked really good. If you do four inch, especially in plastic mulch, it just tends to shred the mulch up. You're making holes just really close to each other. So um, six inch is great. And I would recommend planting the plug just a tiny bit above the soil level, like even just a quarter inch or less. Um, but if soil's contacting that stem, you can get a lot of stem rot issues. Okay, so for early plant care, these plants are very small. You can see in this photo here, they are tiny. So we had a problem, especially out in the field where the wind would pick and slightly, um, pick up and slightly move our plastic mulch. And a lot of times it would cover up our plants. And if we didn't get to them in time, they would get burn on these leaves and that growing point would die out. Um, you can see here, we weighed down the plastic uh, using a thicker material like weed fabric that has the burned holes uh, might be a better option to avoid this issue. Um, something else we did to manage temperature was adding frost blanket. 
in spring, we did this both within the high tunnel and the field, and that just gives that extra um, protection. But ultimately, you do want to manage your temperature for that 75 to 80 degree range during the day. Um, horizontal trellis is really important. I would use at least one layer, if not two. These do get up to 30, 36 inches tall sometimes, and if they bend over, the blooms will start to curve, which can lower your marketability or the amount of your useful stems. Um, so if our plants are three feet tall, I would recommend um, having a trellis at like one foot above the ground and two feet above the ground, so that one third and two third of the plant height. Um, and also here we use a six inch grid mesh. Um, so each plant had its own square to grow within. Um, so again, you just really want to maintain temperature when we're using high tunnels um, in the spring. So we want to vent to maintain that 70 to 80 degree range until the flowers have initiated a bloom. After that, we can allow the temperatures um, to get higher. So in order to really control our high tunnel setting, we add the plastic in the fall, and that helps to prevent any snow from getting inside so our soil doesn't become saturated um, and impossible to till in the spring. So I highly recommend putting it in in the fall. Um, and once you plant in the spring, you can add that row cover for additional freeze damage production. You don't want a really high low tunnel. So using that frost blanket, you want it to be fairly close to the plants, but not touching it. If it's too high, then the hot air will just move to the top of the low tunnel. But if it's touching the plants, you will get freeze damage where it's touching. So the right height is important. Um, and once things started to warm up, you can see we have a lot of flowers blooming. We took the plastic off um, after the danger frost passed, so like late May, and added on our shading before early June. And shading does a couple different things. Um, so we get way more sunlight intensity at our high elevation in Utah than the plants actually need. So when we add the shading, what happens is the plants are signaled to grow taller. They want to reach that light because it's a little bit more limited, right? So we can increase our stem length with shading. Um, and also some of the petals, if they're open for a really long time, they can um, have leaf scorch. I couldn't find a good picture of it, but basically just burned edges around the petals um, and that lowers the sellable stems that you can produce as well. Uh, so field temperature management. Out in the field, you don't have that high tunnel protection. So I would recommend either planting after the last frost date or using floating row cover um, just to help prevent from any frost damage, especially on that new bud of the plant. Uh, horizontal trellis, you can see it here. This is actually snapdragons, but we use the same setup for our lisianthus. So we have our horizontal trellis, we're using wooden stakes to support it, but you could also attach it to these hoops. Um, the hoops can be used as your low tunnel cover. They can also be used for shading. We used a 30% shade cloth and just covered the south side of our planting so that we could easily access. Um, and I'll talk about the results of that later, but you could use up to even 40 or 60% shading. We haven't trialed it yet, um, but that might be worth considering or just covering the entire row. because you can see the snapdragons on the left are getting some sunlight later in the day. So for more of that effect of stem elongation, I would recommend either higher percentage or better coverage of shading. Okay, and a few pests that we saw in the Lysianthus. I um, already talked about soil pathogens a little bit. Um, and this is especially problematic if you're using a capillary mat system. So a lot of soil pathogens can travel through the water. So if we have a single water source that all of the plants are soaking up from, um, that can cause pathogens to really move around in our trays. Uh, so I we used root shield, which is a biological fungicide, I think. There's a lot of other kinds out there, but that really helps. We didn't have a lot of issues there. Um, and another was aphids. 
they love everything, but they really love the lysianthus. And um, they usually feed on stems in June or July. We just used a stream of water to knock them off. We didn't get huge amounts or anything, um, but there are other pesticide options as well if you do have a big infestation. Um, grasshoppers, you can see that they really fed on these petals um, a lot. We use different kinds of bait to help control them. Um, but yeah, just trying to keep grasshoppers out of your areas best because they can do quite a bit of damage. Um, the biggest weed that was a problem was bindweed. It would really circle up the stems of the lysianthus. It can work its way through the plastic mulch holes. Um, and if it does hook onto the buds, it tends to create, you know, kind of a shepherd's hook curve in them, which lowers the marketability as well. So steals nutrients, curves your stems. It's really important to stay on top of that one. Um, so harvesting lysianthus. This was interesting for um, a learning curve for me and all of my assistants. So uh, lysianthus, you can see in this photo here, the lower blooms always open up first. And a lot of times this will be open up for a week before the other ones will start to bloom. And when that happens, you can see in this photo here, the older the blooms, they tend to get, um, just from wind and movement and other things, the edges will get a little bit worn. The vase life will decrease for the specific lower bloom. So I would always pinch off the lower blooms. I'd take them home. You could use them in boutonnieres, corsages, um, bud vases, if you sell bud vase arrangements. But that allows for these next few blooms to really open up at the same time. So that helped me just to um, increase the marketability of my stems. So these are first bloom pinches. I would say this is too early. I'd probably take off this bloom or wait for a couple more to open up. Um, and then depending on who I've talked to, they have um, different ideas of when this should be harvested. So um, this one here is probably a little bit late. You don't want them to be fully open, all of them to be fully open. The lower ones can be open and the top ones just opening. So it kind of depends on you and your market, your florists, what they want. So just have an open communication with them about um, harvest timing and what they prefer. Um, another small trial that we did was pinching. So we pinched the Bolero Blue and you can see a stem that was harvested from a pinch plant on the left and a non-pinch plant on the right. Um, we pinched them, they had eight sets of true leaves. You can see the length decreased by about 50% when we pinched, but we had four to five stems compared to one to three stems of non-pinch. So again, it depends on stem length that um, you want to sell to your florists and your market. Okay, so now I just want to move into the results. I'm going to kind of cruise over this, don't have a lot of time. But um, yields overall was greater in the high tunnel. So the blue bars represent high tunnel, green represents field. And this is the average number of stems harvested per square foot. So for every cultivar, you can see that the high tunnel always produced more stems in the field. Um, and that is due to a couple different things. Um, we can control the temperature better in the high tunnel. Um, we can also plant earlier. So the plants have more time to get established before they hit those warm temperatures in July and high amounts of light that trigger blooming. So that extra time to get things established was really helpful for yield. Um, we also tried a couple different transplant dates. So this is the high tunnel on the top and field on the bottom. And the dark blue and dark green bars are the earlier planting dates and the light bars are the later ones. So we had a March and April in the high tunnel and April and May in the field. And what we found is that Lysianthus, they do prefer those warmer temperatures. So our later planting dates actually yielded more for the most part um, than the earlier ones did. So it doesn't really benefit you a lot to try and plant these earlier. Um, early April in the high tunnel and early May is great in the field. Um, of course, if you're on the Wasatch front, maybe even a couple weeks earlier would be ideal for you since it is a bit warmer. Just remember to transplant before temperatures hit that 80 to 85 range so they don't rosette. 
Um, I talked about shading in the field. So this is our shading field trial. We had some of our stems growing under 30% shade shown in dark blue and full sun shown in light blue. And this is just the percentage breakdown of 12, 16, 20 inch and 24 inch stems. So under the shading, we produced less in that 12 inch range and more in the 16 and 20 inch range. So we did see that increase in stem length, but again, I think you could um, further improve that by either a higher percentage of shading or fuller coverage. Um, so just in general for a high tunnel, you remember we had that, the whole tunnel is covered in shade, right? So more shading coverage, better temperature control, um, so this is the breakdown of stem quality. So we have our high tunnel on the left and the field on the right. The blue is indicated the coals or the unsellable stems. So in the high tunnel, 23% of the stems we harvested were not sellable. In the high tunnel, it was 42%, so nearly half of our stems. Um, and that's a lot to do with stem length. So the lighter green shades so are shorter stem length, darker shades, taller stem length. So in the high tunnel, we were able to reach up to, let's see, the 20 inch, 60 inch on average. And in the field, it was 12 inch on average. So um, the high tunnel really increased our stem length and the price that we could demand for our stems. And another thing that um, led to this is less exposure to wind in the high tunnel. So when plants experience a lot of wind, um, they have kind of a defense mechanism where they start to grow wider rather than taller. So the stem will grow thicker and shorter under those high winds. So out in the field where we had more wind um, beating on those stems, it can result in shorter stems as well as differences in shading. So it's important to have a longer establishment time, um, shading, and less exposure to wind if you really want to increase your stem lengths. And I know I've been harping on the field a lot, but it does have its advantages as well. Um, so field grown, we have the high tunnel here, and this is just the timeline. So all these big spikes, that's when we had big harvest. So you can see in the high tunnel up here in blue, these are both of our planting dates. Um, we really kind of dropped off in September, especially compared to 12 stems here and one stem here. Whereas in the field, we had fairly consistent production throughout the year, especially in September. So if you do want to be producing stems a little bit later in the year, um, field could be the way to go, especially if you are optimizing by those things I talked about in the last slide by blocking wind and increasing shade coverage. So that is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I can take them now. And here's my email if you have more questions. We also have a few other fact sheets about cut flowers. Um, All right, yeah. Megan, um, we don't have time for a lot of the questions, but um, let's see here. One person asked, uh, what are the call parameters? Yes, so call parameters, they were less than 12 inches in length or they had um, either significantly curved stems like that shepherd's look I was talking about. Uh, if the blooms were really damaged, like that grasshopper photo. Um, yeah, even sun scorch blooms, those would be considered coals. Anything that the visual quality is lower. Um, 